folks, welcome back. So today we got to talk about the most recent Sarah Boone hearing. We are marching towards the start of this trial and the anticipation is building. In this most recent hearing, which was almost two hours long, I feel like it's the most Sarah Sarah has been in any of these hearings. I think as she settles in and gets more comfortable talking in court, her bad qualities and off-putting behaviors are really starting to flow out of her more freely and unrestricted than before, to the point in this most recent hearing, I think a couple times she hit that classic Sarah Boone flow state of insufferableness where you can hardly believe what's happening. It's like watching Michael Jordan play basketball or Muhammad Ali box. Some people are just born with it, and knowing what Sarah is capable of, coupled with the childlike sing-songy voice that she uses, I understand. Thank you. I think Sarah is the closest thing to a witch from a fairy tale as I've ever come across. Can't you imagine that you're a kid walking through a forest, you're having a good day, and then you stumble on a quaint, cozy cottage with smoke curling out of the chimney. And the door swings open and it's Boone, and with her childlike sing-songy voice, she invites you in for cookies and milk. Then 30 minutes later, she's boiling your head in a giant pot. I also think that Sarah is gaining a huge false sense of confidence doing these hearings. I think Sarah thinks, you know what? This is going pretty good. I can do this. I'm making my little arguments. I'm not letting anyone push me around. I'm filing motions. I'm really doing it. This isn't going half bad. I'm excelling at this. And I don't think Sarah realizes just how bad bad things are going to start going once it finally starts. One, the prosecution is pretty much not even pushing back on anything right now. Out of the, out of the whole two-hour, almost two-hour hearing, the prosecution maybe lightly pushed back on one little thing at the very beginning. We'll talk about it. And then for the rest of the almost two hours, if the judge is like, all right, prosecution, do you have any opinion on this matter? They'd be like, no, whatever. We like, why would we care about that? So she's not getting any pushback at all. And I think her confidence is like, hey, you know, no one messes with Boone in the courtroom. And then second, all of the little stuff that they're arguing right now is really low stakes and easy to argue about. It's a lot easier to argue about whether I get to use an open classroom at the jail or not, or whether I get to wear pants or a skirt during trial or not, or whether I get to keep the USB drive with the evidence on it overnight, or I have to give it back to the guards at bedtime. This is all very, you know, it's a lot easier to argue I want to keep the USB drive, then I didn't torture and murder and film a snuff film of my boyfriend. Then the prosecution is also going to go from not pushing back at all to flip and going full vicious pushback. We're going to watch the video again. Turn up the volume. And I think Sarah is delusional of just how this is really going to go when the jury is staring at her. I've noticed that she really starts to melt down and talk fast and say a bunch of nonsense when one she's asked to give a follow-up example like she's pretty good at just stating her claim you know confidently but then if the judge goes all right well you're saying that the lawyers are, are all lying to you what's one example of 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 the lie of the lawyers and then she she can't she, there isn't one and she starts talking fast and doing the whole Sarah Boone thing. And then if she gets accused of something, that's when she really starts to get shaken and rattled too, which may be one of the worst moments of, the, of her interrogation is she's trying to go, it's no malicious. And then the, the male interrogator goes, Sarah, he was begging for his life, begging. And you didn't, and Sarah because she got pressed. She wasn't planning to say this, but she got pressed in that moment, and she's not good at being accused and pressed. She said maybe the worst thing. She goes, yeah, George does that. He's done that before, like a like a whole, like, oh, woe is me thing. 
And it's like, man, Sarah, that just isn't going to cut it in front of a jury. If you get a little bit pressed and rattled and flustered because the prosecution is starting to say the hard truth straight to you and straight to the jury, you can't get flustered and just... Yeah, well, George does that. He's kind of a woe is me, the boy that cried wolf type of thing. And it's like that is going to die such a miserable, brutal death in trial that Sarah's head is going to spin sitting there alone at the wood table. Okay, so let's just go over what was discussed in this hearing. They started out, Sarah really wanted a private evidentiary hearing where there's no media. Her argument was, I think that I should have a little bit of privacy for this one very important hearing where I look at the evidence and I just want maybe to have one piece of evidence not be online already. So I would, quote, have one card to play at trial, which is kind of funny because it's like, Sarah, you don't have the card you're going to play. And her saying that, you could see how it went so bad with all the lawyers because the lawyers with experience and knowledge of the law talking to Sarah going we need one card to play and if we just have a winning mindset and are really keen we can win this and you got to think the lawyers were like Sarah you just got to trust me with all the experience we don't have a card to play any card we have to play the prosecution's gonna play your video playing that video is a lot better than any little card you're gonna come up with and then Sarah thinks they don't have a winning mindset and doesn't want to work with them anymore and so she's going, I just want one, one hearing. I'm not asking for all of the hearings to be media free, close from the me. I'm not, I just want this one very important hearing. And so maybe I'll have a card, one card to play that's not already on the internet at trial. And this is when the prosecution very lightly pushed back. And it was kind of funny. She just goes, Judge, I know that you know the standards that need to be met to have a hearing closed. She came nowhere near proving that at all and the judge agreed he was like you failed to to prove that it should be private but then the prosecution i think just trying to be accommodating and not really trying to fight the hard fight yet was i guess there is a second option to have the evidentiary hearing at the sheriff's office or at the police station when which would make it so the media wouldn't be there so the prosecution was like we're fine doing that, and then Sarah really wanted to do that. So the way I understand it, it will be private. So Sarah did win on that one, but just because the prosecution, I don't think cares. Then that's it's like you got to pick your battles. This isn't our battle yet. The battle starts on the first day of trial, and we're playing the video. Get the speakers in the courtroom turned up because we're playing the video with the volume on, and it's gonna start to get nasty. So that was Sarah's first thing that she wanted to argue she wanted a private evidentiary hearing and i think she got it okay so the second thing and then at, from this point off on the uh the prosecution just really doesn't even care about any of this stuff and so the second thing and this really sums up what it's like to work with sarah so in the last hearing Sarah want, filed a motion that she wanted the shackles off her feet to be taken off and the handcuffs to be taken off so she could write and defend herself without being handcuffed, which I think is fair. And so they're trying to be above and beyond accommodating just so Sarah can't claim it was unfair and get a mistrial and we have to do this whole thing again. So they're trying to give her a few choices with everything they can. They want to, they got to keep everybody safe that has to be around her at the jail. It's really the only pushback of anything is just if it's a safety concern. No one's trying to stick it to Sarah with any of these. And so they, they said, all right, Sarah, you can either have We'll take the handcuffs off, but the options are you can have chains around your feet, but we'll tape them so they don't jingle and jangle so the jury doesn't get in their head that, oh, she is guilty, that she has chains, and start associating you with chains. And so that's what they did with Daryl Brooks. So we'll put chains on your feet, but the jury won't see them and they won't make any noise, or you can have no chains and you can have shock. Um, what are they called? Just like shock. I don't know, basically something that 
attaches to both of her legs. What's it called? A shock cuff. It attaches to both of her legs down by her Achilles. And then two different people in the courtroom have a button. It can't just be one. It's not just one person because if they sat on it or accidentally hit it, you'd, she'd get a shock. So two different bailiffs or deputies have the button and then if sarah like went to go stab a witness or the judge or something they would both hit it and it would give her a shock and she'd fall over and so they gave her that choice they said sarah you can either wear the shock cuff you know it'll go down by they'll put it on each day down by your achilles you'll sign a waiver that you agree to wear it and you can do that you don't have to wear chains or you can wear the shackles and it'll be all taped up so it doesn't make any noise sarah wanted the shot cuff by far far and away that was the choice that she wanted okay you get the shot cuff we gave you a couple options you picked one okay now we're at the most recent hearing and they're just plugging along doing this very low stakes should be very easy stuff and after the they talked about having a private evidence hearing or not then it moved on to okay sarah you were you were spoken to whether you want to wear um, they're they're going to put the clothes, get you some clothes together for the trial. You get to wear civilian clothes again so the jury doesn't associate you with being in jail and being guilty. So we'll get you some clothes. Did the, the judge goes, did the, did so-and-so talk to you about that? I think you get to wear, you get to choose either pants or a skirt. Did you think about that or make your decision? And Sarah goes, I would very much uh, rather wear a skirt. And it's like, well, I mean, you picked, though, the shot cuff at the last hearing. So if you pick the skirt, the jury is possibly going to see the shot cuff. And and it's like, you think Sarah would be like, oh, you know what? I do. I really appreciate giving you me the choices with the shot cuff. I do understand. I'll just wear pants. No big deal. It doesn't matter. It's not going to affect anything. I'll just wear pants. But she is strongly, no, I want to wear a skirt. So now they're having to figure out, okay, can we use the shot cuff with a skirt? And at one point, Sarah asked if they could just put the shot cuff higher up her leg and and she still gets to wear the skirt. Imagine some bailiff having to like put the shot cuff up Sarah's leg like some garter. And then I was thinking, is Sarah's strategy with the skirt, is she going to try to seduce the jury i was picturing her trying to make a show of hiking up her skirt and seductively crossing and uncrossing her legs towards the jury the jury's just like sarah please just present your case and she's just trying to hike it up like hey you guys you like that and so it turned into this whole thing it's like all right How do we now, if she wants to wear a skirt, does the shot cuff work? How is this even, how are we even having to spend time on this? But that's the Sarah Boone strategy. All right. And then, so after they, I think she's going to decide on that is where it ended up. She's going to decide if she wants to wear the pants or the skirt, but she still wants the shot cuff. Again, they asked the prosecution, do you care? And they were like, no, whatever. All right. So then it moved into... They dealt with Sarah had put in eight requests and these are all associated with what she thinks is fair to prepare for her case. And so the state had no opinion on any of these. And so who argued kind of against these, I guess, although wasn't really against is they had remotely up on a screen a captain of security at the jail that she lives at, and then a lawyer for the Department of Corrections. So the lawyer for the Department of Corrections is commenting on the legal side of these requests, and then the captain of security is commenting on the security issues that may come up, and that's maybe why they couldn't do them. But anyway, the first request is she wants more time with her laptop that has all of the discovery and everything and the the usb drive she wanted it for more time she had it from 8 a.m to 4 p.m and she didn't think that was enough and so the jail added along with the 8 a.m to 4 p.m they added the or they added on from sunday to thursday she gets 8 p.m now to 10 p.m and then from friday and friday and saturday friday and saturday sorry she gets 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. 
but it's still collected at four and she was happy about that. All right, so moving on. The second request. She wants the USB drives with a bunch of the evidence on it. She wants to keep them at her bunk and not have to give them back. And that was turned down because the captain of security said there's a bunch of metal in there and hard enough materials that they could be stolen from you or she could make a weapon out of them. Essentially, a shank could be made. So you got they just out of security for everybody in the jail. There's a lot more people than just Sarah. She's got to give them back at the end of the night. And I was thinking, man, can you imagine getting shanked with murder evidence? It's like, how'd you get murdered? I got stabbed with other murder evidence. Can you believe that? What a drag. And so that was a no on the USB drives. Okay. And then I had said in my last video that she did get to use the empty classroom at the jail. Well, that either was wrong or now the captain of security has come back and said, no, you can't use the classroom. There's no way for my guard to always watch you in the classroom. If something happens out in the non-classroom area, he's going to have to run out and then you're going to be alone in the classroom and also carrying all of the stuff and papers and laptop and everything into the classroom as a security risk and then to be moving that back and forth so sorry sarah you cannot use the classroom and sarah was pretty um she was not happy about that one just saying like how why wouldn't i be able to use just the dark classroom if no one's using it why couldn't i go in there for an hour or two a day and the the um this captain of security is just saying because you can't and it was kind of funny maybe the most pushback of out of all of this was the the department of corrections lawyer that is just sitting there remotely too because he came on and said like legally she gets what all of the other pro se inmates get she gets pencils paper envelopes stamps some time to do it and legally that's really all that she you know gets and all of this other stuff is just above and beyond we're trying to be accommodating we're trying to do everything we can while keeping all of the other hundreds of people in the jail safe but this he was saying all of this really is above and beyond it's not like i'm against it but it just is all of uh, all is above and beyond what pretty much everybody gets and then sarah really got attached to that and wanted to know well what did other pros say inmates get at what point is it above and beyond is there a packet that the jail has that could be given out of what you normally get so she would know what would be above and beyond and she's asking questions and the lawyer for the Department of Corrections doesn't answer and it's just silent for a while. So she finishes her question. So what is above and beyond? If I'm being, if, if it's, if you're saying I'm going above and beyond, I want to know what is above and beyond. And then it's silent, silent, silent. And then the lawyer just goes, yeah, I don't know. I'm, am I a witness in this case? Is, why is she asking, why is she asking me questions? And the judge is like, yeah, Sarah, he's, He's just a lawyer representing the captain of security. He's been under no obligation to answer any of your questions. And and at one point, the, the lawyer for the, the Department of Corrections, what did he say? He goes, it was kind of getting heated between him and Sarah. And he, and he goes, I'll advise the jail on the law. I'm not going to advise you on the law. And she goes, something like, very good or thank you just kind of moved on but he definitely shut her down pretty hard okay number four she wants earphones or headphones they had never had anyone ask for that and saw no no need that they needed to make it happen just this one time so they, they said no sorry no earphones and headphones and i was thinking you think sarah as she's using her little laptop to prepare for her case and she's got the evidence and the USB drives in and she's going through it and she's making notes, probably some folder is titled Sarah's cell phone and then maybe she clicks on that. There's probably a couple video folders titled Suitcase Video 1 and Suitcase Video 2. As she's sitting there staring at the icon of that video, do you think she clicks on it? 
I would guess not. And maybe that's why she wants headphones. It's a, it's not it's not a great feeling playing the audio of your snuff film while your cellmate is down like making dinner or brushing their teeth. Hey, sorry, it's going to be a little bit brutal. I'm I'm watching the, you know, the video, but she should probably click on it and watch it. If the first time she hears that video, she couldn't watch even 30 seconds of it during her interrogation. All of a sudden, it's going to be played over and over again, and the jury's going to be staring at her. And I am, I'm excited to see how she handles the old suitcase video. But they just said a flat no for the headphones and earphones. All right, so she wanted a internet access and phone. They just said no. I think if it was up to Sarah, she would want a an office in her cell that was designed by a professional interior designer with an antique maple desk and a ergonomic quality office chair with certified lumbar support. A computer lab with full-time 24-hour uh, tech support, some paralegals, a phone in her cell directly to the a phone on the bedside table of the judge. Like the, just picture the judge and his wife are sleeping. It's two in the morning, and then a a red phone on the judge's bedside table rings loudly, and he picks it up. Hello. Your Honor, it's Boone. I was wondering if you got my latest motion. Uh, Sarah, it's it's two in the morning. This is this is about as uh, unprofessional and unacceptable as you can get. Your Honor, I had a motion, but she re she really she really wanted full internet, a full phone, and they said no. All right. Next one, number six, is she wanted a Word program. That one also got rejected. They just said you can just write it out, send letters. And also, they kept mentioning, remember, Sarah, we are paying for a private investigator for you. So any phone calls or any of this stuff that you're not happy that you're not able to do the second that you want to do it, just have your private investigator do it. No problem. And then the last one was she wanted the discovery hard copies and the judge really doesn't care about giving her the hard copies except it's a fire hazard the amount of paper in the cardboard boxes starts to be a fire hazard there's a lot of people in the jail that aren't sarah that they have to keep safe and so you would think sarah was in the like the heated middle of her murder trial going full but all it really was is she's not getting any pushback it's just the captain going all right well we just can't have the the cardboard boxes you can have another flame retardant bag but then she goes if they're in a bag they'll just the, the papers are all just will mix together and they're like we'll give you some manila envelopes and it's just a lot of discussion and arguing for things that i don't think should be you know too difficult to and then she also filed the motion she wants a neuropsychologist for, for part of her case wonder what the hell she's planning to do with that I was wondering if, if she's going to get a little rattled during trial and just start going with the whole, it was a good day. It was a good day. That's what I'm hoping for. Maybe she's trying to find an expert in whether a day was good or not as, may, as her expert witness. She's looking for an expert witness, and maybe I could do that. It's like, hi, yes, my name is Scott Sharp. I am a board uncertified expert on whether a day was good or not. And after reviewing all of the information and evidence from that day, I conclude that it was very much a bad day. Nowhere close to even being close to a good day. That's my opinion. Sorry, Sarah. But I actually think the expert that she wants is for her battered spouse defense. And I was thinking about it from the last video I did. What I think she's going to do is... The no malicious, not intentional, and then the battered spouse defense. But with the battered spouse defense, it has to be that the, pers the, the person was trapped, had no other choice but to kill the spouse. And you could make a better argument that George was the battered spouse than she was. Because 
I'm pretty sure he was dependent on her financially and for a roof over his head. She had the money. She had the vehicle. She had a really good escape. She, Her ex-husband that lived, I'm pretty sure, walking distance away didn't love when she did it, but allowed her when they would get all drunk and start really fighting and it would get ugly. He would allow her to escape to his place and sleep over there. And so if George didn't have a place walking distance away of an ex that would let him come over whenever things get a little heated, if he didn't have money to do escape, a vehicle to do escape, he you could really paint a picture that George was a lot more trapped in the situation than she was, especially the whole financial thing. And one last thing, I was going to talk about the evidence, I think. All right, this is just, I was trying to think the relevant evidence in the whole thing, and it's definitely, if I was the prosecution, I'm showing the video, obviously, a bunch of times. I'm doing the circumstances around the 911 call. If she really, if it was a adult game in hi, of hide and go seek gone bad, you would have called 911 before the next day in the afternoon, and she called her ex husband first. So the circumstances around the 911 call are really incriminating. You got to call the medical expert to talk about George's head injuries and all of that stuff. God, I'd probably talk, maybe bring up the ex-husband, or he probably wouldn't want to come up, but he did a couple interrogations or interview type things. You got to show those. You can really get a good sense of Sarah, how she would get drunk and abusive even before George and both of Sarah's. I'm showing the whole interrogation. Sarah did an interrogation the night they found George in the car of the police officers and then the next day she came in and watching her full interrogation which you know has six million views on youtube watching that and then the suitcase video she's cooked i mean it doesn't matter what card she thinks she can play and if she has a winning mindset and if she makes these deranged ads for a lawyer she's cooked and it's going to be really interesting once the confidence of hey, these hearings are going pretty good, and she starts getting cooked what her change of behavior is going to be like because in the interrogation, any time that she's pressed a little bit, it starts to get really bad, and she says stuff like, oh, yeah, he does that. It's a whole, like, woe is me thing. It's like, Sarah, you just said, oh, woe is me. He's begging for his life. You're calling him the boy that cried wolf. You think that's going to work for the jury, even if you're hiking your skirt up and crossing and uncrossing your legs? It is going to be something. I'm cutting it off there. I love you all. See you next time. Why? Stabbing why? No malicious. Sure.